Welcome to the only thing that matters, getting your startup to product market fit here on Chicago Founders TV. We bring you interviews with Hall of Fame level founders on the secrets to their success, how they achieve product market fit, so you can nail it in your own startup. Today's episode features my friend Brett Hurt. Brett is one of Austin's top entrepreneurs. He recently co-founded Data.World. Before that, he had co-founded Bizarre Voice, which he built and took public. And prior to that, he co-founded Core Metrics, which he built and sold to IBM. In his Founder Story interview, Brett describes how Core Metrics product market fit grew out of a problem he had in an earlier business. I grew up, you know, as we discussed earlier, working in my parents' stores. And we could ask customers how they found us, and we could see how they're navigating and learn, you know, a lot from just watching our customers. And that was just intuition. Um, I also wrote my leadership paper at Warden on Sam Walton, who wrote a brilliant book called Made in America, which anybody interested in retail should read. He actually wrote it for his children, say, this is how you run a retail operation. And you know, say what you will about Walmart or Amazon or, or anybody else, but they are obsessively customer focused. They study customer behavior obsessively. And that was built into the DNA of Walmart from the beginning. And so, um, so you know, I thought I need to have some kind of ability to see what the heck people are doing inside of this online store that I've launched with my wife. I have no idea. I mean, I know there's orders coming out. Like, you know, we'd get an order from someone in London. We'd be like, wow, that's so cool. Someone in London just bought from our little site here in Philadelphia. Or we'd get an order, you know, from someone in Hawaii or someone at a military base. And, but I had no clue, like, what was the process of them getting to that decision? And so I started to build um, analytics. And the novel thing that, that we built that I didn't realize was novel at the time, it just seemed intuitive, was we didn't use web server log files which are really written for, you know, they're generated for technical debugging purposes. We instead wrote the actions that people were taking directly into a database. So someone puts something in their shopping cart, an action's captured. Someone comes in from a Google search or Yahoo search, an action's captured. And was that intentional or how did that? It just seemed intuitive to me that you'd want to build a profile on every customer of all of their behavior to be able to understand and run any query you could imagine and then be able to personalize as well. And it's hard so to get that data out of the web logs. It's, it's almost impossible. And I didn't know it at the time, but all the solutions in the industry, because I didn't go out there and try to buy a solution. I'm not going to buy a solution. I created my own e-commerce site. You know, it's just, I'll build my own. Um, you know, we didn't have the kind of money, too, to buy a big, hunking enterprise software solution. Um, but, but ultimately, uh, they all used web server log files. I didn't know that they did. I would have never designed it that way. It, that would make no sense. But for whatever reason, the industry had evolved where they used web server log files, which are not written for marketing actions. Um, so what was the impact? You build this internal technology, mm -hmm. and how's it go? It went phenomenally well. I mean, we got our conversion ratio from around 1.8%, which is around industry average uh, back then, to um, a little bit over 3.5%. Uh, wow. Um, and that was through doing all types of targeted offers where we'd see people browsing fat burners, for example, and then target them with an offer in their fourth session, today only, 10% off, and see how they respond to that. And they were the only, that group was the only one getting those offers, doing targeted email, all these things that just seemed kind of intuitive from the way I grew up. So, so talk a little bit then, so you have this great innovation to help your core business. At what point do you realize that the capability you build to help your core business is a business? So I, I wanted to make it better. Um, I, felt, I felt like I'd kind of maxed out in doing this on my own and you know, me and my wife. Uh, and so I thought, I'm going to go learn from the best of the best. I'm going to go learn from Amazon and CDNow, because I had classmates at both companies that had graduated before me. I'm going to go learn how they've done this. Mm -hmm. um, and frankly, they're going to laugh at me. And, and so I set, up, I set up the meeting saying, look, I know you guys are going to laugh at what I built for my dinky little e-commerce site here. Um, but, uh, but I really want your feedback on it. And I want you to tell me what you use and kind of contrast the two and tell me how to make this better. Like, I just want to learn. You know, do this as a favor to me. And so um, I started out at a, at a meeting at CDNow with just my friend, 
And he's like, I can't believe you can do that. He's like, hold on, let me go grab some people. And eventually had an audience of like eight people, including the head of marketing there, saying, I don't know how you're doing that. And I was like, well, you come from P&G, and you know way more about marketing. And she was definitely way smarter than me at marketing. I'm like, how can you not do that? Mm -hmm. I was like, I just read about your one-to-one -one personalization effort in this, in this newspaper. And she's and like, was, yeah, that's just all bullshit. What was the answer? Um, why, why, why couldn't they do it? And so, 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 she, so she basically said, well, you know, we are using an analytics solution. And you know, we paid $300,000 for it. And I said, wow, well, show me that. And she said, well, it's right there. She pointed on a shelf, and it was in shrink wrap on, on the shelf. And I said, well, how is that possible? She said, well, it'll take about 18 months to install. And IT is just, just so bandwidth constrained, just trying to keep up with traffic. We have to remember back then, there was no cloud infrastructure. You had to keep up with your own um, you know, web servers and everything else. And they were growing so quickly that the, the IT people had no time to install anything. And so I walked out of, and I had a similar reaction at Amazon, um, where they said, you won't believe this, but what you have is better than what we have. Wow. But we could never actually hire someone like you to do this, because we'll all get fired. Because <laughs> um, you know, we're, be, we're supposed to have stuff like this. I, I kept on having those conversations. I talked to with at least 100 retailers. Um, and I said, what metrics but, but Let me ask would, you, before you do, why a lot of entrepreneurs would say, I got two green lights. I think you got CE now as a customer, right? Mm -hmm. I have a customer. Scale, 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 baby. You instead decided that you didn't have enough intel, enough insight to sort of really take the product where you wanted, which turned out to be a great call. What, what is it that made you not put your foot on the gas coming out of the CD, having CD now as a customer, and instead that you wanted to learn more? Well, I, I did put my foot on the gas in terms of building a team, like, like, like saying, we actually have to build. It takes know, time to talk a, to 100 a, different retailers. Yeah, but you know, it doesn't take as much time as you'd think. I mean, you can talk with why three, did four you a day. Why did you prioritize that? I prioritized that because I, it, just, it just seemed natural that I didn't want to guess at it. You know, why, why would I want to guess at what metrics they would want? Why not I go and ask them specifically, what is your dream metrics to run your business? Like, here's how I've run my business. Um, and I was able to have a good conversation with them because I was also a retailer. Um, but you know, what, what would be your dream? You know, what, what specifically do you need to run you know, your marketing, your merchandising, et cetera? And eventually the, the, the reports grew to the point where we'd walk into a sales meeting and the client would say, or the prospect would say, oh my gosh, it's like you were reading my mind about everything I could possibly ever want to know about running my business. And I'm thinking internally, well, that's because I've talked with 100 people like you. Um, the, the solutions that ultimately I saw that were in the market, it was literally like they hadn't talked with a single marketer. I mean, it, it was like they had tried to guess at what people needed. And when you talked with their customers, it was clear that they never talked with them either. So tell, um, what, what was the benefit of that? How did in the, the next year or two, how did that to what degree did that pay off in the sort of near to medium term? Well, we, we in, the, in the near term, um, we just won customers like crazy. Um, we, uh, now, you realize I went to school in 97 to 99. Um, so we had, this, we had this cowbell in the office, and we we're ringing the cowbell all the time. We we're signing dot com after dot com after dot com and getting quotes like, you know, there are some pretty lewd quotes, but I'll share one of the lewd quotes here. Like one was like, this is like crack for marketers, you know? And Brett's approach is a lot like Field Glass founder Jay Shikowitz's approach, which, by the way, is one of our highest rated episodes. If you haven't checked it out, definitely do. A lot of great insights in there. Like Jay, Brett sets out to interview potential customers before building a line of code. He tests value propositions and pain points until he finds something truly profound to base a company and a product off of. In fact, he often and typically mocks up the software so you can see what it looks like and test it with consumers, but won't build it until he has customers already signed up to buy it. In the next segment, Brett tells the founding story of Bizarre Voice, how they nailed product market fit on the way to reaching $100 million in revenue in only their sixth year. Um, so in our brainstorms, we were like, well, 
what else have, has not been done here? And we both uh, came up with the idea for customer reviews, partially because I was just about to become a new parent. Mm -hmm. And I was shopping for uh, strollers. <laughs> and my wife and I got all different ranges of opinions about strollers. You know, whenever you have a child or do any new habit, you know, any, any, any new world you're about to enter into, all of a sudden, you know, it's called selective perception and advertising. There's this whole new world of brands that you didn't even know exists. So Peg Perego and, you know, Britax and all these things kind of come in to your life that were always advertising to you before. You just never knew they were there because mm -hmm. you weren't paying any attention because you didn't care about kids. And, and, um, and, and now, you know, with this child, we're like, well, we need to make the right decision about a stroller. So we asked friends and family, got completely confused. Um, and uh, one night we were shopping on Amazon and we read an aerospace engineer's review on the Peg Prego Pleco P3 stroller. And <laughs> it was phenomenal. I mean, it's like six paragraphs long. Um, he had taken it apart, put it back together again, compared it against all these other models. So raw and authentic, you know, like he had become the stroller guru in, in my eyes. And um, we bought that night based on a complete stranger. And so Brant and I were like, well, how many core metrics clients use reviews? Because that would have been the best, right? To see who is using reviews and then measure it. Zero. Hmm. How is it zero? And we found that there were only three retailers in the whole US in 2005 which had customer reviews. We're like, how is this possible? Um, and then we're like, well, clearly Amazon knows what they're doing. Well, there, there must be some, something Bezos has said about how this works. Nothing. All Bezos said, it's just the right thing to do for the customer. No metrics, nothing. No case studies, nothing. Um, well, we just decided, you know, ultimately I got to the point where I felt like, A, core metrics is going to be successful. And I now have earned the right to start my next company. There were many years where if I had left, the company would have just gone, gone under. But I felt like it's gotten to the point where it's very solid. B, um, it just felt like a calling. Like it felt like, wow, we could, we could create a lot of democracy here. Like, like we could create a voice you know, for all these customers, but we still didn't have any metrics, but we left core metrics based on the intuition that it would work. And I think that intuition was formed by measuring so many things at Core Metrics. We left on a Friday. On Monday, we were in an office uh, the next Monday um, for Bizarre Voice. And lo and behold, a Core Metrics client launches reviews, the fourth retailer to launch them. So we call them up and we say, look, we'd like to do a free study for you. This is a study that would normally cost you $20,000 or so. We're going to do it completely for free, but we need to have access to, we need to tell people exactly how it worked. And this guy was so grateful because he's like, hey, you know, I launched this, but I might get fired, you know, for negative reviews. And I've actually, he actually hid the stars on the product page um, uh, behind a tab. You couldn't even see the summary. Like you could see the product and you could see there's reviews in this dark corner and go click on it. Well, that actually created the perfect A-B split test because you now knew exactly how many people saw the product page and how many then clicked and whether or not hmm. each path bought. You could tell that in core metrics. You could create segments and see, compare, you know, it's A-B split test. And we found that people that read reviews converted at an over 90% higher rate wow. than those that didn't. And to put that in perspective, everything we had measured at Core Metrics maybe was a 30% improvement at the best. We never saw anything that was 90% improvement. Hmm. So um, we're like, wow, this is going to be a big market. Um, and we just we then leveraged that case study and started to run and call every retailer we could. And did you use a similar approach to get to understand the market needs? How did you do it this time? Well, we, we definitely. Uh, you know, we had created a much larger network, um, you know, because I knew most of these people. I was on the board of directors of shop.org uh, by then, which is the online division or the digital division of the National Retail Federation. And so, um, so yes, we showed them lots and lots of demos. We took lots and lots of feedback in. Um, I don't know if we talked with 100. I mean, the reality about Bizarre Voice is it was so much better timed that we started to sell it um, uh, immediately. Um, and it, it was such a pent-up need 
Uh, and I think we're the right people to sell it to because there was, there was a lot of fear. It wasn't like it was a layup. There was a lot of fear about negative reviews and what that would mean for sales um, and whether or not people would get fired because um, reviews weren't and how, So how fast was the early growth? It was, it was very, very fast. And we grew from zero to over 100 million of revenue in six years. Um, wow. And so it, it, it just took off. And the amazing thing is that we, we uh, raised uh, over the time before we went public $24 million. We only spent $12 million of that. Wow. Only invested $12 million of that to get to 100 million revenue run rate as wow. a SaaS business. Um, it's really capital efficient.